Got a little book too. I want to make another quick book related video, uh, not only because books are my passion, but also because I'm playing footsie with a new crushing deadline, something something virtually anyone in my position other than me would simply say that it is not possible. I routinely do things like that and that gives people ideas, but I'm reminding myself, uh, and it's not a it's not a grudging reminder that I am the book section editor of a print newspaper. Now, it's a small print newspaper, one of the smallest in the country, but it's beautiful. It's beautifully designed. Big Canoe News in northern Georgia is beautifully designed. And it's a book section. It's not the book's coverage of the art section. It's two whole beautifully illustrated pages of book's coverage. I'm the editor of that section. And as an old friend of mine said last year, Positions like that don't fall off trucks. It's you can you can go a long time without without accidentally working your way into a position like that. So it's the kind of crushing that I love. I ad honestly never thought it would happen to me again. I used to have this kind of job a long time ago, and I loved it. I loved every minute of it, even when there were headaches like now. I loved every minute of it, and I still do. I was amazed and pleased to find out that feeling doesn't go away. That, at least now, thanks to the great folks in northern Georgia, that feeling has not changed at all. So it's a good kind of crushing, but nevertheless, it's making me all of a sudden look around for things I could maybe do, <laughs> things that I've been neglecting. In fact, ironically enough, uh, I mean, I, I have work ethic. I know how to buckle down and get this done. I indulge myself in these little squirmings out here and there, but I am going to get this done impossible as it is. It is flatly impossible on its face, but I'm going to get it done anyway. Uh, but one of the things that I did to sort of amuse myself instead of buckling down to work was a tiny little thing, one of those tiny little things around the house that the first time you sort of half-ass tried it, it didn't work, and you've after that it's grown in your mind as something that's just not possible. You're going to have to hire somebody to come in and fix it. When actually it's just that the one time you half-ass tried it, you half-ass tried it. So naturally it didn't work. I went at that thing again with a vengeance, and it suddenly behaved itself. I solved it. It's a tiny little thing, but it was annoying. It was a noticeable problem. I solved it in two seconds. Uh, so a little good has come out of this kind of procrastination. I thought in addition to uh, a mail haul, I would do another video. I don't really know what this is. Maybe a, a, an am reading. I always say on this channel that am reading is really not a thing that applies to me because I either... I start a book and then I finish it, and then I talk about it or write about it, but I don't stop in the middle anymore. There's no reason for me to anymore. It's not, I'm not saying that I don't do that because I'm superior to you. That isn't what makes me superior to you. What makes me superior to you is my pillow apex and my eight washboard ab. Obviously, I would think. I'd like to think that's obvious. The reading part has nothing to do with it. The reading part is a reflection not of my inherent super haughty giga chad superiority to the ruck of the human race, but rather to the fact that I don't have anything else. I have cleared away all of the bramble around reading in my life so that when I start a book, I read it and then I finish it. Uh, but that, I do a lot of rereading as well, that, so I don't have, this is a kind of am reading, but it's, it's mainly I'm caught in between not so much the front page and the last page of a book as a block of reading and a block of rereading. So I thought, I thought we'd go over some books that I've recently reread and then some books that I am planning on rereading, if that makes any sense at all. So let's, where are we going to start here? Oh, well, we can start with a disappointment. One of the books that I, uh, that I reread, I read this years and years ago. In fact, when did this come out? Yeah, I read this in the 80s uh, and liked it a lot. And I found a copy again and uh, reread it. I didn't. I wasn't really aware that it was a reread until I started. I read the introduction and then I realized, oh yeah, it didn't quite look like this, but I, I definitely read this once upon a time. I found the Faber Book of Letters uh, at the Brattle. I found this, uh, I think, months ago. And I gave it a reread, and I love collections of letters. This is snail mail. It's gone. So I have. it's always a weird thing when you live across a dividing line of one era of history or some historical activity into a new era. 
in which other activities replace that activity and that activity is gone. That's always a weird thing. And I've lived through quite a few of those. <laughs> I've, lived, I've lived through quite a few of those. Uh, that was on my mind when I was rereading this, but the main reaction that I had was disappointment. Not in the selection. The, the selection is just fine, but with the book, the physical book. Not only is it it's a trade paperback, so I'm, I'm worried about it. The whole time when I'm reading, I'm worried about it because the print goes all the way into the gutter there so, you know, I have to open the book all the way to get at the print. And that had me worrying about the spine the whole time. But on top of that, look at the print. That's pretty small. All throughout. The thing is too short, anyway, a collection of letters that is less than a thousand pages long, imagine. But those concerns were on my mind the whole time I was rereading it. I got some great stuff out of it. I copied a bunch of great lines into my journal. But the whole time I was worried that the thing was just going to fall apart. And the whole time I was negotiating with the print, which cannot be read in all lights or all settings or at all angles, to say nothing of marginalia. I actually had a bunch of marginalia for this book and I wrote it separately. I wrote it on a separate piece of paper. <sighs> Talk about 18th century. So this is uh, going, this is going out the door. Uh, this is a letter collection that I kind of sort of like, but I'm not keeping it. Because it isn't anywhere near as good as an E version of it would be. Plain and simple. It was, it was annoying and distracting to read this trade paperback, which 20 years ago, I wouldn't have even known what you meant by that. 20 years ago, I might have said, well, okay, Maybe I should get a hardcover, so it's a little more durable. Uh, but I wouldn't have thought, no, there's a complete alternative. There wasn't a complete alternative. Now there is. There's just a complete alternative. Now, I have no idea if there's an e-copy of this book. There are e-copies of plenty of collected letters. I, I didn't. I, I extracted as much as I want from this book, but I am never going to read it again. It's actually made me wonder about, uh, there's a point that's come up in a few recent videos, it's made me wonder about my relationship with print books which is kind of a weird thing to have. It's kind of a weird wonder to feel when you've got thousands of them all around you. But not all of them are like this. This is a little egregious. It's too skimpy a selection. It's too skimpy on uh, annotation. There's virtually none. And it's too skimpy on the prose. The, the print size is just, it's inhospitable. So it, I, I reread it, but I had to be extra careful the whole time. No thank you. <laughs> then I reread something else. Uh, this is a hardcover. Uh, a big thing, a wonderful thing. This is Dermot McCullough's big book on the Reformation, his history of the Protestant Reformation, which would be, I mean, this has chapters of its own in his huge ma magisterial history of Christianity, the first 3,000 years. This is where he, he goes to the Reformation, which is the greatest earthquake in the history of Christianity, and gives it a whole big book on its own. This is, a, what, I think, a little more than half the whole size of Christianity, so... A lot of space. And he's really, really good. Dermot McCullough is really, really good. He has a very a very dry, observational tone that is wonderful because it, it, it perfectly accommodates high, high church historian humor, which happens all throughout this book. It happens all throughout Christianity as well. It happens all throughout his biography of Thomas Cromwell, believe it or not. This it, oh, no no knee slappers, no outright humor, but a a kind of wry observational humor that crops up with a regular with a, with a regularity and is really enjoyable. But oh my God, everything else, his research, his personality portraits, just fan. I I read this when it first came out. Again, once again, I read this when it first came out. I didn't reread it when I got it at the Brattle. I reread it uh, just now. This came out in. Uh, 2003, and I read it then, and it, of course, you, this is a must-read author, you read whatever he writes, and uh, I liked it a lot. I thought it was really, really good. I, I still had a sweet spot for Christianity, and I still do. I, I believe Christianity will be considered this author's masterpiece, but uh, the reread really, really picked out a lot of the nuances, a lot of the, the just amazing amounts of research that he incorporates into this book. Very much 
as you're reading it, paragraph by paragraph, treatment by treatment, very much you know that you're in the presence of a scholar. And when I was finished with it, I wanted a particular reread. Now, this one, I have no grounds for complaint because it was an e-copy. It was blissful. It was a blissful experience. I mean, with this thing, first of all, it's not long enough. And I was, oh, better be careful. I want to I wanna read all the way into the, to, to the gutter, so I have to hold it wide open like that. But that might crease the spine or even break the spine. Oh, better be careful. And then, oh, what have I got here? Here's a letter to Jane Austen. What if I want to write something? Well, I've got all that much space to do it. <laughs> There was that. I was wrestling with that book the whole time. And then with this thing, this is five pounds. So, you know, I, which is just fine when you're right here. But uh, most of the time you're going to be right here. <laughs> and, then, and then you're going to be at the end here. <laughs> and when you're not doing those things, it's still sitting on top of you. Five pounds sitting on top of you. Just five pounds in the hand. No way on earth you want to just casually take this to the bathroom, if nature calls, or into the kitchen, if you're waiting for something to boil or something like that. No way on earth you're going to take something. It might be permanently damaged if you did that. So, once again, although I love the book, I was wrestling with the form, the format. I was wrestling with what I can't help but view as 20th century technology. Uh, so I didn't have that with when I finally, with a gasp of relief, I went to my tablet. <laughs> I went to my e-reader and also my iPad mini and reread uh, Will and Ariel Durant's book on the Reformation. Same thing. Big, probably the exact same page count. 800, 900 pages on the Reformation. Same format. It's beginnings. It's major documents. It's major personalities. I, I thought, I reread the Reformation and thought, what better time to reread Will and Ariel Durant's volume on the Reformation? Not only because I love these books, just love them. I think they're just fantastic. They, I, my estimation of them grows with time instead of diminishing, which you might think would happen because you assume that in a book like these are 60 years old, you assume that the lack of cutting edge scholarly apparatus like Dear Red Bacala brings to the, to the subject would hurt the book. But no, no, that flies in the face of what I myself always say about history, which is that it's a kind of narrative. It ought not to be reliant on the very latest monograph, and we shouldn't discard it when it no longer is. We, we, we discard beautifully done histories way too easily by saying, oh, it's not the latest thing. Uh, we don't do that with fiction, much though we should. <laughs> but I reread this, and boy, oh boy, the contrasts with Dermot McCullough uh, were just so stunning. They were just so stunning. Dermot McCullough is, has that icy academic reserve. It's very choice. But he is not in any way a natural storyteller. I don't think he would even recognize that as a valuable thing to be. And Will Durant absolutely is. That's the foremost thing that he is. And it's, therefore, night and day. I myself believe that the fundamental research into the questions of the Reformation, the issues, the personalities, the events, I don't think that Will and Ariel Durant did any less research on those fundamental questions than Darren McCullough would do, you know, 70 years later. I don't think this is a dumb book, a dumber book, than that at all. But... Boy, oh boy, once that playing field is level, the storytelling is, it's a, it's a very, very different experience. And I loved both of them. Not, I'm not, I, no, no offense to Dermot McCullough, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that if I had to choose one way or the other to tell the same story, I'd go with this. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure that I would. It, 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 this is the tone, the tenor, the unembarrassed humanism that I love most in the historians that I love most going back 6,000 years. So probably it would be this, but what a joy it was to reread. And you know, I think I enjoyed the reread 10 times more because it was directly after rereading reading another book on the subject. I really do think that was true. Uh, and then, so that was, those were rereads. Uh, okay, so then we'll do uh, the rereads that are coming up, the rereads that I'm going to be doing. But first, we will do uh, 
something that I never actually did get around to, and that is a, a therefore a reread. Unless I did get around to it, and it was so forgettable that I'm I'm going to need to dig into it before I remember that. But I don't think so. This is by Nasri Noor. It's the first volume in the Wild Heart series. It's called The Prince of Flowers. And there is The Prince of Flowers. This is something for the gays. Got to have something for the gays. Uh, and this is about, it, it's a fantasy novel in which uh, the son of a famous summoner, a sorcerer who can summon fantastical beasts at will and control them. Uh, it's a magical discipline. And the son of that famous summoner is very bad at it can't seem to, to master it, can't, can't succeed in his summoner academy or whatnot. And he summons a fae, uh, a, a fairy warrior, a fairy, a fairy dude, bro, a fairy hottie. <laughs> and his, the whole point of it is that he is able to control this fae, that he's able to dominate him. And in the course of the novel, I gather love blossoms between those cracks. <laughs> and they, and uh, this is the first in a series that I believe has gone on. This was once again suggested to me by Amazon. I would never have known this was out there if not for this. I will certainly give it a try. I hesitate to say that a book like this will rise or fall on the strength of its world building. I'm pretty sure that its priorities lie elsewhere. <laughs> but... Maybe it does those priorities well. Who knows? And I'm not 100% sure that I didn't just burn right through this and forget about it. If I did, well, you can't think of anything much more damning to the author than that, right? But I'll, I'll find out. If I did, if I read the first 20 pages or so and realize, oh, wait, you did read this. Remember how it ends? No wonder you didn't remember it. I might give the next book in the series a try usually not usually my yardstick is with especially with self-published stuff like this no matter how well designed it is usually my yardstick is that if i read the first volume and i'm not blown away i won't read the second one there's just too much stuff out there for me to persevere you know in, in order for giving my time which is the most valuable coin that any of us has to to offer giving my time in order to watch the author learn his craft I, I don't know. We'll find out. But in the meantime, we have rereads that, uh, that I'm going to do. And the first one was suggested by a little free library in my neighborhood. We went, the Bean and I went out on a walk today. It was, uh, it's a raw, gray day that is threatening snow. It really does feel like snow in the air. I don't know if you can hear that sound someone has decided to run a snow plow down the street but there's no snow so someone's going to have to answer to their boss <laughs> once they come down from their quaalude high uh it's it's felt like that all day that kind of a raw intrusive day that it isn't all that cold but it, that kind of a day that's foreboding snow always feels colder than it is and the, there's a, a kind of a flirtatious threat of snow in the air for the whole weekend uh, but we were out and about. We came across a little free library, and I found a book. It's in pretty rough shape. It's waterlogged and bloated. But in a way, that often makes me like these things better. I will I will dry this thing out and see if it is salvageable. I think that it is. I think that it has at least one read in it. Uh, because it's an old Penguin paperback, and those are often incredibly durable. <laughs> I have a copy of The Praise of Folly, the Penguin classic Praise of Folly that has been through a lot, <laughs> and it's still around, I can still read it. This is The Death of the Heart by the great Elizabeth Bowen. This is uh, her novel about uh, a young woman who's, who falls in love with a cat, and the, you know it's a perfect example of the, uh, the kind of novel where every reader is, is yelling at the page saying, oh, come on. We know his backstory and you don't, but you should know enough to, to steer clear. You're going to get hurt. I love Elizabeth Bowen. I think she's fantastic. And I haven't read Death of the Heart in probably 10 years. There was a, in fact, one of you might know. I don't have the details off the top of my head. But about 10 years ago, I think, there was a really attractive paperback reprint. That's what I got. I got that from the publisher and reread it. She's always a delight to read. Oh my, she's always a delight to read. There is a big, 50 years ago, there was a big, blue dust jacketed hardcover with the collected stories of Elizabeth Bowen. I always see that thing in a trade paperback used in secondhand shops at the Brattle and whatnot. 
And I know from experience that that trade paperback is poorly made. So, to say nothing of, if it's at the Brattle, it will have sat out in the elements, which will just dry up the glue even worse. I want the hardcover of that, and I haven't seen the hardcover in a while. Her short stories are virtuoso. This, though, I don't think this is unsalvageable. It's, it's been... It, it, the Little Free Library, where I, uh, I found it, is obviously not as shipshape against the elements as a lot of them like to be. I've seen some Little Free Libraries that look like they had uh, better insulation than Hyde Cottage does. This one, I think, had leaks all over. I think that's the only reason why this was in there. But I will give it a try. Absolutely. Uh, with all the goodwill in the world, because I already love this author. I think she's great. This is a great novel. Uh, the next two rereads, uh, no goodwill in the world. In fact, the opposite of goodwill. But I, the reviews have come rolling in from all the high-power usual suspects that you would expect. And I was expecting those reviews. I could practically have written some of them. They don't surprise me. They don't even disappoint me. I know the game. I know how it's played. I don't have to play it. Thankfully, I don't have to play the game at all. I have a well-respected online literary journal, Open Letters Review, that is mine. I don't have to kowtow to anybody. I don't have to do anything or pass on anything. I don't have to play any kind of politics. I can simply write reviews for Open Letters Review and then put them out into the world. And since it's the successor to Open Letters Monthly, which you know was around for 10 years, it has a built-in audience of people who pay attention to it. That is great. I have that. And I'm also, as I mentioned, the book section editor of a print newspaper. With uh, uh, My editor-in-chief, a wonderful editor-in-chief, has told me, you have a free hand. I will not interfere with what you do. I will never come to you and say, hey, you know, my second cousin once removed wrote a book. I want you to review it. I won't do anything. It's your section. That is wonderful. That is exactly what you want to hear from an editor-in-chief if you're going to take on a job like this. I didn't think there were any jobs like this left in the world. But uh, I have those things. Plus, I have YouTube. So I don't need to play the game. I don't need to have some editor come to me and say, oh, you know, this is a big thing. Got to write about it. And you're probably going to like it, right? I mean, you got to give it serious attention. You certainly can't kick it around for 800 words. You can't do that. We don't even be a laughing stock or anything. Come on, dude. I mean, come on, dude. And of course, I'm referring to Cormac McCarthy. I, have, I read his two book brace set uh, during the summer. I got, I got advanced copies during the summer. And uh, to put it mildly, I was not impressed, but I decided to give them serious attention. I knew they were going to get reviewed everywhere. And I gave them a lot of thought, mauled over them a lot. Not just because I knew they were going to get reviewed everywhere, but also because I knew that a lot of friends of mine were going to write, read them and write about them and grapple with them. I think it's totally wasted. It shouldn't be happening. There are plenty of books out there that deserve to be grappled with that they're not grappling with because they've never heard of the author. It, whereas Cormac McCarthy has this weird cultural freight that comes along with his name so that if he writes so much as, you know, I love you, People feel like they have to parse it and grapple with it and come to terms with it and deal with it and write some sort of retweet-worthy pronouncement headline for whatever the review is. Uh, these are the two books. These are the finished copies of The Passenger and Stella Maris. One is twice the size of the other. And they came, you know, they're, they're sort of a, a set uh, I have the, the advanced copies, but I have the, the, the two finished copies with the deckled edges and all. And the two finished copies have just been sitting there, staring at me, and I thought... Uh, they've been sitting there staring at me, and I thought, okay, well... you got a lot of other things to read. You're wrapping up a year of reading. You have a huge amount to do. And you already know, you read these things during the summer, you already know that this is Old Man Yells at Cloud Garbage. And that no one is going to call it that, so what's the point? What, what's the point of reading it and thinking that? What's the point of rereading it? It's not going to convince you otherwise, but sure enough, all of the high-profile reviews thinking, the think pieces about Cormac McCarthy and what these two books mean, I have worked on me just a bit, as I imagine that reviews work on lots of people. Just because I write them doesn't mean I don't read them like other people. They have, those reviews have, in, to put it briefly, uh, 25 minutes, 
they've convinced me that maybe I should give these things one more try in the finished copy. So I will clear my mind as much as I can and reread these two. I, I will do what I didn't do this summer. I will read them as one novel. I will read them back to back and uh, immediately to just see if that changes the reading experience at all. Uh, I don't think it will. Uh, even on a line by line level, there is so much in these books that is deplorable. It's not just bad, it's deplorable. And these things only have fanboys. Even the critics who aren't Cormac McCarthy fanboys are thinking, well, he's definitely major. Even though I'm not a fanboy, you can't deny that he's major. I can indeed deny that. On a line-by-line -line basis, on a chapter-by-chapter -chapter basis, I can indeed deny that. And I can back up what I say, but it doesn't do a bit of good. With this author, it doesn't do a bit of good. People, I, I did, as you may know, well, actually, a lot of you new people might not. I did a four-part, highly detailed review of Cormac McCarthy's Pulitzer Prize-winning piece of crap novel, The Road. And that review, that four-part review, was not me just saying for one 30-minute video after another, I didn't like this. I didn't like this. I picked it apart, objectively, critically, line by line. I wasn't saying this metaphor doesn't work. I was saying this scene doesn't work. This, the conception of what's going on here doesn't work. The characterization doesn't work. And here's how it doesn't work. This is the A, B, C way it doesn't work. In exactly the same way that if someone put together an electric fan wrong, you would be able to take it apart and say, this is how it doesn't work. And I made those videos, and if you, I don't go back to those videos, but if, if you go back to those videos, I guarantee you, there will be comments from people who watched the whole thing and then left a comment like, I can't believe this guy doesn't like Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> when I wasn't saying in the videos that I don't like him, I was saying this novel is bad and here's why. It doesn't make a bit of difference. They heard all the points I made, bounced right off. Just bounced right off. Just, just you know, the metaphor is the, the last refuge of the scoundrel. Just anything that I, that I said didn't work must be a metaphor. <laughs> That's not how metaphors work either. Uh, so I know that that kind of thing doesn't matter. In fact, knowing that kind of thing, knowing that the critical the critical evaluation of an author just doesn't matter, not just to the fanboys, but to the critical conversation. The critical conversation's already made its way up, its mind up about these books. That's what I said before they even appeared. I said the thing I reject about them, the thing I hate most about them, is that the conversation is already over about them, and even the galleys haven't appeared yet. I was the first person to get Callies. And even then, I, you, I was thinking of critics in the country and saying, all right, well, you don't have this yet, but you all, I could already write your review. So what is the point of all of this stupid kabuki theater? Just better to just get it over with, just pass it like a kidney stone. Now that I know that not only the, does a critical analysis of what this guy is actually writing on the page not mean anything to the dude bros, but it also doesn't mean anything to other critics, why would I bother to do it? Why would, I, why would I bother to do anything at all? I wouldn't... <sighs> anyway, I'm ranting, <laughs> but I will stop. I will stop ranting, and I will give these a reread. I'll read them back to back as one novel. Maybe that will change the reading experience. Uh, and I will use this as a reward. This will be my electric bunny at the Greyhound track. <laughs> this will be my reward. This poor, bloated, battered copy of Death of the Heart will be what I get I will reread this only when I'm done with these. <sighs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. But there, there, that was just a bookish video. It was 30 minutes of me faffing on about books that I have reread or that I'm going to read or that I'm going to reread. No real point to it, except that I really don't think I can justify doing a Steve stream tonight. And... Uh, I kind of wanted to avoid, <laughs> to avoid a little work. But I'm done with that now. My Catholic guilt of conscience is finally pulling at my elbow. So I will stop this video. It was just a ramble about books. That's all. I will wrap this up, and I will be back. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.